Now you can get into Warhammer this week. Yeah. Right? You can go you can go and buy your first model. Yeah. You can paint your first model. Yeah, yeah. You can have it uploaded to Instagram for thousands of people to see by the end of the day. If you're painting as a beginner, nothing is more frustrating than like wanting it to be better and being subconscious about the fact of you, you know it's not where you want it to be. All cards, I've never ever wanted to quit. That's not I've never been at the point of like I want to give up. Unfortunately, I could not say the same. <laughs> <laughs> I could do a paint job that I'm proud of that if you turned it out, you might consider it a failure because our goals would be different, our skill level's different, everything's so different. Right then, guys, let's get started with today's uh, topic question, which is overcoming failures as miniature painters. So what are your biggest fails in miniature painting? And specifically, how can someone get out of a hobby painting rut? Mm. That is a very, very in-depth, in-depth question. It's a big one this That's week. a big yeah. question. Uh, with many years of painting, there are obviously lots and lots of failures that do occur. Um, but I, I just want to say as a caveat that I think that a failure is important. Like I, d I don't want it to come across like a sense of negativity, I don't think. I think that like having failures in miniature painting is very, very important. It's part of your... Um, ability to progress as a painter and learn from those mistakes that's what they are they're learning opportunities rather than oh i didn't succeed or i didn't do well um so for me there's been a few uh, i probably think one of my biggest ones is um when i done my night army i picked a color scheme that i, I had to do it in a very short space of time so it's like I've got four weeks. Um, uh, Always a great way to start a project. <laughs> yeah, tell it's me about a really it. Yeah. unrealistic, unrealistic time, time frame, especially. But uh, look, I was look, less model count. Um, we'll talk. I'll go into a bit more detail in context in a second. It was second. to go to no retreat. Right? It was, was yeah, yeah, yeah. It was to go to no retreat. Was that so? Is that a competitive competition yeah. thing for the listeners? Yeah, yeah. So, like a, a no retreat from the guys at SN. They they do like a, um, a really good tournament uh, called No Retreat, where you go there uh, to Gibraltar. Uh, it used to be in like a venue on the top of the on top of the nearly the top of the mountain, and then they've moved it to this really cool boat. So it's it's quite cool. Um, it's quite quite. It's not what you think of when you think of a. Normal 40k tournament. tournament it's like right. very well number one you're on a boat in gibraltar this is a bougie competition uh, yeah, yeah. But number two, i've never used that word before but yeah <laughs> number it's two it's yeah. like it's way more there's not hundreds of people there like it's very limited you have to apply to get in and, and so on yeah so on. uh look, um so uh for, for me like i i want i it was difficult. I picked a color scheme, which I could have gone quite easy and just, just, um, picked a, a scheme, a single color scheme and gone a bit mad with it. Um, but I decided to do, uh, to take something I'm really into, which is obviously cars and stuff. And I got, um, uh, 1966 golf racing color scheme from the GT40 for anyone that's a car enthusiast. <laughs> um, and I wanted to put that onto my night army. So it's like an eggshell blue, um, eggshell blue with orange like stripes or accents. Another colour scheme. Yeah, another, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no golf symbols. Uh, we'll put the there. we'll put some pictures up of the nights maybe on the. Instagram. Yeah, if you're watching the video version of the podcast, that should be on screen now. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah, we'll put we'll put some we'll put some pictures up. Um, but I first I I the, the biggest one the biggest I say failures. I mean, this isn't like a drastic failure, but for me it was because I just hemorrhaged so much time, um, especially when you're working to a tight deadline. Um, I must have gone through colour selection. I must have gone through about. 20 different eggshell blues that, to, to, to try and find one which 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 looked right finished correctly and covered well so was this like mid painting process or was this like in the testing oh that, that was it was i uh, there was no testing it was, no it, testing. It was literally, <laughs> it was literally the like, process was the test the process so was basically the test. you started painting it i had one spare armor panel which i'd done a test on and right. that got covered in about eight or nine different eggshell blues right. um so so yeah so I, I I've always been uh, a user of the Holy Trinity so like Scale seventy five Vallejo and Citadel they're the colours that I've always always tended to work with, um, but for I, eventually I didn't go with a paint from any of those manufacturers it was uh, it was a company called Mister Hobby uh, which is a funny funny Mr. name Hobby. It's, it is seriously they're <laughs> that great was the first time I've heard of yeah, it they're, well, they're, they're, they're really good go check them out that's not uh, sort of, we're not sponsored or anything but but. Um, but yes, yeah, but the process to get to that color was actually quite frustrating, uh, and I had many failures during that process trying to find the right the right color for it. Um, I tried like Vallejo eggshell blue. I tried the air version. I tried the the model color version, um, and they just didn't have the. Obviously, bear in mind, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, um, uh, I'm trying to emulate a color scheme from from a car racing team from the '60s, you know. Um, 
Uh, and and I, I must have gone through about four or five, four or five attempts at getting mixes and bits and bobs, and it just didn't get anywhere near where I wanted. And at the same time, time is like burning away. Like the date for no retreat is getting closer and closer and closer and closer. Um, and uh, and yeah, it just took forever to get the color correct. And I eventually found, uh, I eventually found through some recommendations from different people, obviously this Mr. Hobby uh, color that I used, um, which went on like a dream. But then obviously it's my well, first, I don't really use like non, like, like Tamiya's and things like that. So I had thinning them and it was a complete learning curve for me. And again, much like on a previous episode where where I spoke about doing the, the a really stressful thing in the shortest space time, space of time, you do get tangible benefit of learning on the on the wing, which I suppose is a good thing. But for me, it just it, it when it came to doing like the trim at the end of the process, because I put like black trim on over all the nights. The trim on a night is just crazy. So I ended up <laughs> I was doing like. 12 14 hour days like in and around That's work to, to get the trim painted on it and yeah it was just a really stressful um push and they they were like 90 percent by, by where i would want them at 90 percent by the end of the process but um but yeah for i so i see it i say failure because i like to normally be really planned and have some time to plan and choose colors and make sure the finish is correct or the the, the color when it dries and it's on the plastic it's the vibrancy or the saturation that, that, that i want or whatever the case may be and I, for me, it was a bit of a failure because I, because I just wasted so much time on color selection. I still got the project done, but not to where I would, where I would have wanted it. So to, it was that to... time wasted messing around with trying to find the right color that you could have spent. It sounds like to me that it's more of a, um, an example of pushing past the, the failure because as soon as you found the color, it was like finding the right color. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was yeah. like, as soon as you found the color you were looking for. Yeah, yeah it helped you push past that point of this could be a failure. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well, how, how do we define failure then? Like sort of within, I know it's a, a very open-ended question, but I mean, in, in, when we think about like hobby and like our hobby goals and things like that. So obviously there's a big, there's a big scope there. You could have failure in the sense of like, oh, this project didn't look the way I wanted it to, but obviously you can repaint it, right? So you can overcome that. Then we've got sort of bigger failures in sort of, uh, you know, maybe that was uh, going to a competition and you maybe didn't get the result you wanted or sort of more, um, you know more life stuff you know like maybe it was a failure because you know you didn't uh, you didn't get to a certain point where you could make the hobby a, a bigger part of your life and maybe it let you down or like it was a failure because you did something and then that led to maybe you wanting to quit or something like that whereas this sounds like it was like a project failure it was a project yeah I, I i did see it a bit like that because uh, uh, let's put it this way i know all the eggshell colors from most ranges quite well now which is a virtue i suppose if i ever want to paint eggshell blue again um but uh, i don't think that circumstance is going to arise for quite some time <laughs> that experience give you the intel to sort of not have that same issue again? Or is that just sort of by nature of the fact of it was very last minute, you didn't really have a plan going into it? Yeah, I I, I think the, the main virtues from it are it really falling back on going back to understanding how important a plan is, um, you know, and putting that, put into, putting that time investment into place at, at the beginning of a new project because it is worth it. You know, you don't want to be week two out of four still choosing colors like I was that was not enjoyable at all whatsoever um uh, and at the same time yeah like you know answer to the first part of the question like you know what how do you contextualize it like for me failure there's a huge scope of failure like you have a, a, a critical issue that happens or something completely goes wrong and it does make you think oh you know I don't want to do this anymore whatever blah blah and then all the way through to well I wasted so much time or, or this hasn't turned out exactly how I wanted it um the key learning point for me on this one was just plan more in advance or dedicate a, a specific amount to, 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 to planning. Um, and sometimes, uh, it is worth, it is worth doing that experimentation to get, to get the result better when you actually do do Cause it is like trying to run a race without even having your shoes on, you know, that's, that's kind of how I, that's kind of how <laughs> I've, I've never heard that that's, kind of, that's kind of how I felt, you know, I was like, you know, you need a good pair, a good pair, a good pair of shoes on. But, um, but yeah, so, so that's kind of like for me, the, one of the failures, um, which I, for anyone watching this, I maybe you might think, well, that's not like, considered a huge failure, which, but, but the next thing that I'd explain is a considerable failure. It sounds like it, it, at least a benefit from it was that it opened you up. Like you said, you normally stuck to the, the same three brands of paints if yeah. you could, but all of a sudden opening yourself up to this new, opening, uh, embracing Mr. Hobby. Embracing Mr. <laughs> Hobby. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hobby, for the great color. There's the episode title for this week. Um, <laughs> em embracing Mr. Hobby allowed you to 
to get through this issue that you were having. Yeah. So it's like this thing that you wouldn't normally do where you branched out. Yeah, yeah. Actually oh, solved cool. your problem. Has that given you as well the tools for like future projects? So like now I guess you'd have more consideration for using paints outside of that. Yeah, I think I think definitely. I think that yeah, the, the holy trinity that I use is 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 uh, is a comfort zone which I always go on about. But like yeah, it did push me outside of it, which evidently then made me learn about this other paint range. Um, and because it is in the same vein as like Tammy is and things like that, and you have to dilute it, uh, thin it down with a different thinner, for example it made me learn all those things. So as much as it, it was a failure in time wastage, it was a benefit of learning new paints, learning a new process and, and, and discovering a whole new range of, of, of paints, which are very, very, very good. Uh, you know, so, so yeah, the, 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 I'll, I'll tack on something that maybe the vast majority of viewers will, will consider more of a failure. I, I spent ages making a really amazing character that I was happy with, like converting it, using parts, different bits and bobs, uh, doing a bit of sculpting on it, things like that was in a rush one day to prime stuff and I literally primed it and it was like I was throwing talcum powder at the, the model, you know. Um, uh, I didn't shake the can. I literally just grabbed it and done it because I thought I'd used it a day or two before and it was shaking enough and it, it, and it obviously stuck to the model like crazy. And, and, and then I had this model that I'd spent hours converting, yeah, and it looked like it looked like I'd dunked it in olive oil and then put it through talcum powder, you know. So, <laughs> like, you know, it was... Uh, and that's just, that's just user error of the can, which I'm, I'll hold my hand up to, but it, when you're in that moment of, oh, I'm in a rush, blah, blah, blah. And again, it, it, it dials back to, I should have just gone, right. I'm, I'm in a rush. Now's not the best time to prime it because I'm, I need to, I, 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 what's, what's the virtue of just getting it done? You know, um, especially when you invested so much time into making the model. So did the fallout of that, has, is there anything sort of in that vein sort of led you down the road of like, I need to take a break from this or like maybe thinking about like quitting or just like you know when you've like really just had enough of something you need to take a break have you ever sort of gotten into like that's that kind of rut that you hear a little bit about um in the hobby maybe from maybe because you've been just painting too much like you're just putting too many hours in maybe is, is there anything have you done anything that's directly related to you going you know what let's take a step back from this i need to i need to take a breath yeah for, for certain projects uh I've, I've definitely got there i've never bit all cards i've never ever wanted to quit that's not i've never been at the point of like I want to give up, like as yeah. in get all my get all my models, get them on eBay. Or Unfortunately, I could not say the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never been at that point um, because I've I've I guess I don't know. I just I've never never had that sort of. I've never wanted to give up, but um, I've definitely been there where you've been x amount of hours, tens and tens and tens and tens of hours into a project, or you've put x amount of hours into it and it's not turning out the way that you want it to turn out. And I think in those moments, you do have to completely reset and take a step away. Um, and, and either fill that fill that time you're investing into it with something completely different within the realms of miniature painting, or go and do something else. Put your favorite show on, box set on, go to a, go to a gig, or, or, or do do something that totally removes you from that situation. Well, well how that happened for me was basically uh, I think it was about eighteen months ago. I had I had the biggest commission project I'd, I'd ever had, like by a mile, and the deadline was. It'd be generous to say it was ambitious uh, from from day one, but I was like, you know what, going to put my head down. You know, it's a really really exciting project. I really want to do it, so I'm really going to push myself and I'm going to get it done, and it's going to be fine. And I think that why I think I think in total it was about six weeks I had to do it, and it was like you know like a hundred models or something, vehicles, everything. It was crazy, and there was all supposed to be painted to quite a high level, which was sort of really the issue. It was it was getting them done to the standard they needed to be, and I think I got like four weeks in, you know, like. I was just I remember just getting in my car going home from the office and just thinking why am I doing this <laughs> like I I put in like 12 hour days like you know five six seven days in a row wasn't taking any time off and I think that was really actually the problem is that you can get to a point where you think spending more time on this is better when really sometimes taking a day off you think on face value like oh that's 10 hours I'm not painting when you come back after a day off you're so much more productive correct mm -hmm. yeah. it's like time spent is not a binary like spending time is good because if that time is not doing what you should be doing or you're making a lot of mistakes because you're exhausted from from working yeah and i think that was like the biggest learning curve for me and that was obviously what i took away from it but i remember just thinking like that is the closest i've, I've ever come to quitting and i really did strongly consider it and i i just got it was like i said i just thought why am i doing this what am i doing this but for? how how glad are you that you didn't like are you are you glad that you pushed through i'm so glad that i pushed through exactly. but at the time like that was so not in sight for me and i mm. think in the end i was actually like a bit late on the deadline and i sort of had to split the drop up it was a bit it was a bit difficult but yeah off the back of that like you said i had to take i had to take a break i, I really had to take a break 
and just sort of stop. And it was kind of like we said on the previous episode was, um, you know, thinking about your hobby goals and sort of what you're in it for and what brings you the most mm. enjoyment. Yeah, yeah. And that was the biggest sort of wake up call for me was like, painting for me is not enjoyable in that way. I, I know it is for a lot of people and like more power to you. If that's what you love, you love the, the thrill of like the deadline and all that mm. sort of thing. But uh, for me, that was, yeah, it, it honestly broke me that project. Like it was, it was really a difficult time. Um, and there was more fallout of it beyond the, the project failure. It was like, it was eating into like my personal life, my personal time, not spending time with my family, my, mm. my friends, um, and just being in a bad headspace. Cause obviously, you know, you're spending 12 hours a day painting. I mean, we've all been there at some point in time, obviously, but yeah, yeah. If you spend like 12 hours, 14 hours, maybe even more in a day painting. And then you go home, go to bed. And then you wake up early the next morning, you go and do it again. Yeah. You can only do that for so long. I mean, yeah. even take away from it being painting, that's like a work. Oh, thing. completely. Spend, yeah. spend 12 hours working and then, you know, do that for however long. And yeah. That, I mean, that, that gets into, I think the thing with miniature painting is that I, I bang on about to people who don't do it a lot is how much, like I've, I've been involved in like a lot of different hobbies and creative spaces and stuff like that over the years. Yeah. And, None of the others taught me as much about myself as miniature painting did. And a big part of that is the the fear of failure and how failure is actually treated in the miniature painting industry and Definitely. hobby. You because see it on it's, a pedestal a lot, don't you? Because you see, I think the biggest thing I hear from beginners is like, I've got this really cool model that I'm really, really excited about, but I don't want to paint it yet because I'm worried I'm not going to do it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, so number one, everyone, like, everyone's scared to fail. There's a fear of failure with everyone that's at some point with with something um and i think creatively i've always had that so walking into an industry where actually failure is uh way more common and way more open and spoken about yeah definitely. i mean we're doing a whole oh, <laughs> episode God, yeah. on it now <laughs> like i think the thing that i put it down to a lot of the time is like like if you take music or or whatever a lot of other creative industries or uh, creative hobbies people have so there's a higher amount of people get into them from a really young age so four five six oh i was picking up my dad's guitar when i was four or whatever and i think because of that you get a higher amount of people who by the time they're 15 16 17 are way more comfortable with in that creative space yeah. with miniature painting i think it's very rare that it, we're getting it more now and we see people that are sort of our age uh, who are having kids um, who are getting their kids into painting and you have the young bloods and stuff like that but I still think it's way less common for someone to start that early to the point of it there being a high volume of people who are 15 and incredible so I think you get way more people starting when they're 25 30 35 and I think that results in a high volume of everyone's first attempt at it being bad, yeah. which makes me way more comfortable about my first or third or fifth attempt being bad. It's way more on show. Well, yeah, you're probably yeah. way more self-conscious about it as well. Like you say, because when you're a kid, you're not so worried about, you're not, you're not thinking about what other people are going to think of you so much. And you're not you know, thinking about the fallout of it. Whereas like as an adult who's sort of more self-conscious, you're thinking like, oh, I don't want to not do a good job on this. Like, I think that the, the social media doesn't help with that though. Like you go like nowadays, I mean, back in the day for me and sound super old now, but like white dwarf and going down the local games workshop or war gaming shop or club, that's the only real immersion into other people's painting that you would see. Uh, and typically because of those much more insular, smaller demographics, you, you'd have a, a lesser chance of having someone that, that has a much higher skill set than you. Um, They'll obviously be the odd person down the club or the shop that's obviously a very, very good painter. And you'd, you'd obviously have the cabinet in Games Workshop where maybe some store uh, customer models were put in there or whatever and be the odd person who had some really well-painted models. But nowadays, it's completely the so far the other end of the spectrum. You jump on Instagram and you are bombarded by amazingly painted miniatures, um, uh, just everything you could possibly imagine and want to search for, you can find as in the quality aspects of miniatures. And that's before we talk about YouTube. That's before we talk about so many aspects of the hobby that are now online. So for someone coming into it that that uh, they paint their first model and they've never touched one before, there's the Everest of where expectation is 
is yeah. bombarded upon yeah. you. That's kind of what I was talking about in our like first or second episode or whatever one it was where, um, and I was kind of touching on the social media thing. But I think also with with the acceptance of failure, I'd say that's actually a part where, because some people saw like the clips on on Instagram of me talking about that. And I think they took it out of context a little bit where they thought that I was saying that some people are scared of getting feedback because people are going to be mean. And that isn't what I was getting at. I was getting that some people just don't like to be social and talk to people. But what a lot of the comments were was like, oh, well, you know, this... Um, this hobby and industry, everyone's really nice. You can post yeah, yeah. like something that is objectively bad and you'll still get some positive feedback. Number one, that's not what everyone wants all the time. Like no. I don't really want positive feedback on something that's objectively bad. That will benefit some people because it yeah. gives them drive to carry on, which is fine. But I think the good, just to put a spin on it, the good thing about it is like I'm saying, everyone's so much more open about their failures. Um, and being proud of something that, you know, I could do a paint job that I'm proud of that if you churned it out, you might consider it a failure because our goals would be different. Our skill level's different. Everything's so different. I'm not saying me and you specifically. No, 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 I get what you're people. saying. So I could put something up that I'm really proud of um, or I could put something up that I, I think is a failure. But someone else could see my failure and think that it's amazing and, and they could, you know, comment a few positive things about it or whatever i just think there's there's a lot more openness about failure and i think that being around that in the miniature painting industry has helped me be more open and comfortable with failure elsewhere i yeah. think unfortunately though like that doesn't always necessarily it's not always super visible for a, for a beginner and that's kind of hard to get around because like touching on what you said james i got into the hobby much more recently than both of you it was a, yeah. you know around sort of 2018 we get it you're young <laughs> <laughs> but like at that time uh, that was when i was at university i was um, I have a music background so I was playing in bands doing that sort of thing and I've been playing kind of like you said I've been playing guitar since I was really really young and I was mm. quite quite proficient at it I was studying at university doing that and that was when I picked up the painting and for me that like culture shock of like picking up a hobby and being really really bad at it mm. was like really frustrating because like you said James you go on social media like that's the natural instincts like go on Instagram and look at yeah. what other people are doing I'm like my models don't look anything like that and even though I know now with the foresight is like yeah dude you have no context on that that person's been painting for 25 years of course yeah but at the time looking at it that's all you all you see is their model looks really 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 good my model looks nothing like that and that going into the failure thing is like if you're painting as a beginner nothing is more frustrating than like wanting it to be better and being subconscious about the fact of you, you know it's not where you want it to be yeah yeah i think the biggest example of the the, the biggest way to try and put across what i'm saying with that with the thing with the getting into it young and stuff like that is that with music, for example, and I don't want to always go back to music, but we all have a music background. So it's the easiest thing to draw on for, from all experience. Us, yeah, for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I meant the three of us, not everyone listening. <laughs> everyone who paints uh, Warhammer has a music background. Um, is that, so you started playing, you know, it's completely viable that you can pick up a guitar when you're four years old, right? How, when, when did you show someone your first like song publicly online, let's say? Probably when I was 16. 16. Yeah. Quite a long so time. you'd been doing the. Just to clarify, the, I hadn't been playing guitar since I was four. But yeah, I do yeah, understand yeah. What but you're since, you're, yeah. since you're a child, right? Yeah. It, I think it's, it's quite. It might change now because of the internet and TikTok and stuff like that. I think you've probably got more 13 year olds and stuff recording something and putting it online. Even so, my point is that you're doing the thing that you're showing everyone. You're doing that for years hmm. before anyone sees it really. Yeah, yeah. Now, you can get into Warhammer this week, yeah. right? You can, go, you can go and buy your first model. Yeah. You can paint your first model. Yeah, yeah. You can have it uploaded to Instagram for thousands of people to see by the end of the day. Yeah. So it's a completely skewed thing. You're not seeing, uh, like, you're, you're not... Uh, having as much time to progress so everyone's starting point i feel like is at a way lower level yeah i just want to say two things like just two two things I, I, you know um i actually hate the word failure in our industry i hate the word failure because it's a it's a lesson to learn learn from you know failure means that there's no chance for any progression from it which isn't the case and i will throw in the acronym that i always use which which i really mean it the word fear false expectations appearing real 
your false expectations of what's going to happen or what will be a result of not doing well, whatever the case may be, is purely in your mind. Like if you don't try, you will not know how the outcome or how you are good at a certain thing or how you're not good at a certain thing. And I think you should not have fear when it comes to it. There's no majorly bad thing that's going to come out of it. So yeah. at the end of the day, like the bigger things to remember is it's just paint. You can either strip the model and start again, exactly. or you can yeah. go buy a new one if exactly. you really, really have to. Yeah, exactly. Right. So this is a new segment that we're doing. It's called question of the week. So anyone, if you have a uh, question that you want to submit for this section, please leave it as a comment or on our Instagram story. So this week's question is, how can you complement your miniature with a suitable base? This is going to take longer than five minutes. <laughs> um, I see a base as an integral part of a miniature. You're immersing the, the model into a world and that base should have, in my mind, in my opinion, it should have as much invested into it as a miniature. I think sometimes, it, obviously it depends on what you're using the model for, but even with minimal effort, you can make quite an immersive base that adds so much to the miniature. This is before we talk about color relationships and color theory and making a base that complements the inherent color of the miniature or whatever the case may be. But you shouldn't skimp on a base, in my opinion. I think it's a really important part. Uh, it, it, it is directly linked to the model, as in the model is standing on that base, and that is the world and environment that the model is part of. So it tells just as much as a story for the for the piece or for the model as the the, the decals or the transfers that are on it or the, 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 the kill markings on the gun or, or any of those kind of things. So definitely, definitely do not skimp on them uh, and just really take take some time to think about that model or that army or the setting that they're in or what you want to put across as to what the base should have on it in my mind um as i said it doesn't need to be super time like in time laborious you could you can do some quite minimal things even just sticking tufts on or putting like a, a skull on there you know or putting a putting a, a fallen weapon from an enemy of one of your mate's armies or something like that you know there's loads of things you can do which does inherently add a whole weight of value to that miniature and add narrative to that physical piece i think that a lot of people do sometimes skimp on it which is a shame because it is just as much yeah. of the hobby inside as it's, the model it's difficult when you want to get armies done and stuff isn't it i suppose that people want it to is skimp yeah on it. but i think yeah the biggest things i would say in terms of like planning that stuff is the color relationships that you just pointed out because i think we get a lot of people where let's say for example um they want some people get this idea that they want a base that they they want a theme that they know that they like so yeah. like oh i really want a snow base or i really want a jungle base or something like that and it's like although like camouflage wise it would make sense if say you're, you've got like white scars and you want it on a snow base i get that that makes sense like camouflage wise but looking at a model it's gonna look a little bit weird yeah, correct. potentially yeah, yeah if you go for a full like tundra base it's full white and you, oh, you ask for a white base rim as well or something like that. Like, I think, so it's just something to think about where like it, it is good. It's a 50, 50, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. W working out what colors are going to make sense with the, uh, with the, the armor of the, of the model. Yeah, I yeah. think also, yeah, like you say, it's a continuation of telling the story, isn't it? So it's the story that you're telling with the base should match up to details that are on the model. I Correct. Think. Yeah. I do, you'll I do you'll agree benefit a lot from that. Yeah. All right. Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Pain Perspective. You might have noticed now that we are live on Spotify, iTunes, all the other places that you might like to listen to podcasts. So if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can take this with you on the go. So thank you everyone for listening. Please feel free to leave your comments below and uh, follow us on all the socials, do all the things, share with your friends. Thank you very much. <laughs>